Hello, I am Larry Lafontaine Stokes. I am a professor at the University of Michigan of American Culture, Romance Languages and Literatures, Women and Gender Studies, and Latina, Latino, Latinx Studies. And today I am speaking with our invited guest, Awilda Rodriguez Lora. Hola, Awilda. How are you? Hola. Hola, Larry. Thank you so much for this opportunity and to get the chance to talk to you again. I always love talking to you. I'm, I'm so happy to be talking to you today. So our conversation today is part of a series called Performing the Moment, Performing the Movement, sponsored by the Center for World Performance Studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And today is Saturday, March 6, 2021. <laughs> So as part of this series, different faculty at the University of Michigan have been talking to artists about the current crises that we are experiencing and also learning about what different artists do, whether in the United States, in the Caribbean, in Europe, or in other locations around the world. The question motivating this series is how is performance being used to respond to the political social, health, and environmental crises that we face at this moment. Today, we will have the opportunity to speak with Awilda Rodriguez Lora, who is speaking to us from San Juan, Puerto Rico. I am speaking from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So we will have the opportunity to learn about Awilda Rodriguez Lora's career and her performances and artistic projects, and also learn about how she and other artists in Puerto Rico are dealing with the multiple crises that we are facing. Awilda Rodriguez Lora is a performance choreographer and cultural entrepreneur. She challenges in her work the concepts of woman, sexuality, and self-determination. She explores these concepts through the use of movement, sound, and video, as well as through literal instantiations of an economy of living. And that's going to be one of my questions. Um, what is an economy of living that either potentiates or subtracts from her body's value in the contemporary art market? Awilda was born in Mexico, raised in Puerto Rico, and works in between North and South America and the Caribbean. Her performances move across multiple geographic histories and realities, and she promotes progressive dialogues regarding hemispheric colonial legacies and the unstable categories of race, gender, class, and sexuality. She has been an invited guest artist at BAD, the Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance, which we all love with Arthur Aviles and Charles Rice Gonzalez at New York University, the Art Institute of Chicago, Columbia College Dance Center, and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, among others. Her solo work has been featured at the Deformes Performance Biennale in Chile, and at the Posta Sur Performance Encounter, also in Chile, at Independence Dome in the Dominican Republic, and at the Miami International Performance Art Festival in the United States. She is currently a host at La Rosario in Santurce, where she is creating, researching, and producing her life project, La Mujer Maravilla. <laughs> so we'll get to learn a little bit more about what La Mujer Maravilla is all about, while developing new strategies for the sustainability of live arts in Puerto Rico. After more than 10 years of work as a fully independent artist, she is committed to further studying how artistic economies can be harnessed to support alternative forms of life rooted in communality, creativity, and social justice. So welcome to Performing the Moment, Performing the Movement, Awilda. Gracias, gracias, muchas gracias, Larry. So Awilda, I thought that we could start um, maybe just asking you, how are you and how are things in Puerto Rico? Um, well, I'm doing well. I'm, I am very grateful to be doing um, good in a sense, right, in regards, particularly, you know, the economy is a big, you know, conversation here in regards to, especially when you think of COVID and, and art making and performance. 
So I'm, in that sense, I feel like I'm teaching at the University of Sagrado Corazón and I'm getting to, to teach entrepreneurship for dancers, which is very interesting because it combines kind of my two passions. And then I'm also, I just finished a workshop for La Mujer Maravilla at La Goico, which is a community center close to here. So even with the impact of COVID in regards to performing live, which that was an impact and that was much more difficult at the beginning of this, which was a year ago. Now it's like, in, it's beautiful to see how we as humans can adapt to whatever situation, right? And how we adapt is very diverse, right? And that's what we're trying to, in some ways, I think also trying to ask through my work, how are the, all those ways of us um, adapting and surviving. But in, and then, you know, the heart and the soul, it has its moments, it's difficult. There's been a lot of mourning in, in this time. So there's some of that, but as of today, I'm feeling quite, you know, grateful and calm and serene. So it's a good day, <laughs> let me say that. And we're I, in San Juan, Santurza, Puerto Rico, which is my home and where I love, it's my base. So that is what I've been here for a year now. Like without moving, I mean, because I, I moved 10 years ago. Yes, yes. So, mm -hmm. so we are one year, at least one year into the coronavirus crisis and one year into the pandemic. But Puerto Rico, because the weather is warmer, it is a tropical country. So in some senses, you're still able to do things outdoors. Could you tell us a little bit more about Lagoico? Well, Taller Comunidad Lagoico, um, they've been now for, because with Maria, like it's kind of three years in, in, in the space of really activating the space, but it's actually a, a community-based uh, project. Neighbors of the neighbor, you know, <laughs> sorry for the redundance, but the neighbors met and they started just starting as meeting it as a way of finding a way, um, understanding best practices for sharing community. So from strategies about recycling, uh, they used to do events, uh, Festival de la Calle Loiza. There's a lot of like this arts and culture and well-being and um, the ecosystem that they work. So now they actually have a space and they've been working to have the space. The space was actually an abandoned school that was closed down during the crisis of, of the many, many phases of the crisis here in Puerto Rico when um, a lot of, schools, public schools got closed down. And we, at this point, there's almost 800 schools. And as a strategy to create a cultural hub and also a space for health and different kind of activities that the Taller Comunidad Aragoico offers for elders, children, adults, um, diverse groups from culture, plena, danza. They do also theater. They're also collaborating with El Estuario, which is also a very important um, organization here for the environment. So, and because they're really close, also been supporters of my work in many ways from allowing me to teach there, but also as part of the festival that like I always have to perform. So we have a really um, sustainable in a way of, of sustainable in the sense of living, like we really take care of each other. Um, and then there's a lot of fabulous neighbors that I have, which also intersect other areas from Puchi Plateau, Mariana Reyes, Tito Matos. And it's like, it's a really cool community. It's really amazing. They even have a, their comedor, which is like what would be the cafeteria of, of the school, is turned into kind of a hub for whenever we went through Maria and during the, particularly during the earthquake is when they were most established. Um, it was a hub, they have um, solo, electricity and they also have solar energy and they also have internet. So it's also a place where we go and because of that, they also have a kitchen that we can share. So it's also, that's always since we all went through, right? Uh, the impacts of Maria and Irma, we understand the importance of having those basic needs and so sure the community can meet. So, and from that, they also do festival. They've been doing testings for COVID and now they're also with initiative for the vaccine. So they. They're doing a lot of the work to make sure that we stay healthy and, and also healthy in, in all the aspects of, of wellness, right? So you, you've, you've mentioned several things that, that I, I want to highlight. 
for, first is that the COVID crisis and emergency is not the only emergency that Puerto Ricans are facing or have been facing. In yeah. fact, there is a long-standing fiscal crisis that is over 10 years old and that has mm -hmm. led to the imposition of a fiscal control board. And in 2017, there was two devastating hurricanes, Hurricane Irma and Maria, which left a great part of the island with no electricity and some people even with no water for, for months on end. So the COVID crisis is simply an intensification of crisis after crisis. And what you are describing is how artists and other community members and neighbors have come together, for example, to take over an abandoned school, La Goico, and turn it into a community center and an art center. And that it really thrives because there are so many committed people like yourselves and other people that you have identified. That's, that's I think, that's a real testament to the performance scene in Puerto Rico and why people are able to do so much with so little. So you, you're known as La Performera. Uh, who is La Performera and why is that your artistic name? Well, I always start when I get that question as that La Performera was actually born in Chicago, Illinois which is a very interesting fact. I never thought I would live in the Midwest to start with, but La Performera really had a home to be who she wanted to be. I, I, it's, it started as part of, um, I was doing a mentorship program through Lynx Hall with Tim Miller. And, um, and that's when I started working as a soloist and creating this work, also creating autobiographical work. So it was a lot about my own experience with the diaspora, having to leave Puerto Rico, um, and Tim Miller really pushed me to, to narrate my own story, to tell my story, to use my life experience as inspiration for creating the work. And in that process, I was also challenging what to identify, how to identify myself. Um, and I knew I was more in tune with performer versus dancer, because dancer also had a history for me as I was as a diasporic body, as a black body, as a woman. I would get this kind of attention for calling myself a dancer and a Puerto Rican dancer. And then it was like an exoticizing will happen immediately after that. So I didn't like the term dancer. Also the expectations of the body of a dancer, right? Which I never kind of satisfied in a way. Um, so then when I, I, I did this mentorship program, which was for performance artists, I was like, oh, I think I'm a performer. I can now really do much more. I feel like being a performer gives me much more range of opportunities and, and thinking, not to say that dance isn't, and that's a whole conversation how dance and performance are conversing and theater all the time. But then I needed to translate it and there's no translation for performer in, in Spanish. And I was like, well, no quiero llamarme bailarina, interprete tampoco es, and I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna call myself La Performera, why not? And I mean, I was 30, I was also very daring in that sense of like, I would be La Performera. I'm also in the diaspora, so I'm also kind of in, in minority in a way, even though I don't believe that we're a minority, but I felt that I can just be La Performera. I think if I was in Puerto Rico, I don't think I would feel the same way because of so many amazing performeras that are here and, you know, so there was a sense of like, just believing this thing that I was becoming and also, that had to do with also the creative process of also understanding what I wanted to do with my work and how um, performance then became essential for what I was doing and dance also, but there's, I was also studying, not, I wasn't studying performance studies, but my partner at the time, so I was reading about performance and I was like, but for me, that just is what I do. <laughs> That's incredible. So Awilda was born in Mexico uh, from Puerto Rican parents. Are, are both of your yes. parents Puerto Rican? So yeah, yeah. They, they were in Mexico. So you were born in Mexico, but then you grew up in Puerto Rico. But yes. La Performera was born in Chicago. So there's like these two um, competing, overlapping or symbiotic identities, Awilda and La Performera. And, and that, that is the negotiation of diaspora. Is, is quite fascinating. And how, how we move back between English and Spanish, how we move back between Puerto Rico and other locations like the United States or Mexico yes. or Latin America. Awilda, on your website, you describe the economy of living 
And could you tell us a little bit about what the economy of living is? And also if, if this is the same thing as sustento? Uh, well, sustento comes out of that. I, I, it, and it's, a, a, um, it's a project that uh, it started here after the impacts of Maria and Irma. So obviously after those, that big impact that impacted not only us physically with all the basic things being um, interrupted, but also financially, right? So there was a big question about my sustainability in Puerto Rico and because of, like you mentioned, the fiscal crisis and all the other things that were already making it difficult for us to sustain a, a creative practice here as independent artists. But economy of living is, is for me, I think of the body as the, the first home that we all have. And economy is taking care of the home. So when you think of economy of living and you add life to that term that is in some way so disconnected to the body because it's of, I need this, I need to buy and the consumer income saying capitalism, all these like ways of us thinking of economy and living in a place like Puerto Rico, which I chose to live in, and not to say that for many years, I moved in 2010 and every year I was like, I'm moving, I'm moving out of here. It's so difficult, it's so hard. There's not a lot of jobs for my work and, you know, and, and, and really questioning it, what to do. Um, and then I realized that I needed to shift that mentality into if I choose to live here, I need to understand the value of living here, which is very, you know, it's not called Puerto Rico by mistake, you know, it is a rich port for many reasons. And then for me, it became about the essence of living, right? What is it that I really need to live? And here, you know, I've been able to have a good home, even though I did have a crisis and lost a home at one point. And, that really made me even more uh, questioning about what were my financial decisions and, and how I was deciding to, to manage my economy of living. And, and now, and when I create my work, I also think of value from a place of essence of what we already have, instead of having this colonial view of like, we're not good enough, we're not gonna, if I don't leave, I'm not gonna get this. If, if I don't have, a lot of money I can make art, or if I don't have a big home, I, I'm not gonna be able to have my community. And when you understand, and it's really, what is the essence to your body? It's like, well, I need good health, I need to be happy, I need to think about my mental health, I need to think about where I live, where I sleep. And those are basic things in a way, if we think about it, and, and not, not to find what I believe will be joy and, and completeness and, and being extremely happy out of these external things that at the end of the day, when you lose everything, you're like, you know, I just have to make sure that I am having a way of living that is, is in tune of taking care of my body and it's not gonna damage it in any way. Being from overworking, overproducing, all these other things that go with the taking and capitalism. I hope I explain it. It's a, I'm still developing in a way of, of understanding what I'm trying to say with that, but. As more, you know, I just finished doing this workshop that I mentioned before, and and doing that, I realized I was like, oh wow, we just need the body and the presence, and we can create the work. And that's radical when you think about our need sometimes. Uh, so many people are told no because they don't have funding, they don't have, money, they don't have certain things, and I think they're all very valuable and very wise already. And that, for that, then we understand that we're very bad. <laughs> So, so the economy of living is about surviving, it's about thriving, it's about hustling, it's about making do, resolviendo in a context of permanent crisis. So you just mentioned that you came back to Puerto Rico um, more than 10 years ago in 2010. And I know that one of your strategies precisely for survival has been La Rosario. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what is La Rosario? So we are in La Rosario and La Rosario um, started in 2014 officially and that I just named my home and I transformed my home into this concept that has to do with, again, understanding the value of where I'm at. You know, I, like I mentioned, I did lose my home for a moment and that was really detrimental for just you know, we all need a place to live and that keeps, and I'm at the tourism in my grounding. And I live in La Calle Rosario, so that's also where the name kind of comes about. 
But it is, it started with me by myself and I was renting one of the rooms as a way of sustaining my practice because economically, again, there was a lot of challenges. And since I already live what is called for a lot of people paradise, it's gorgeous. I have the beautiful beach clothes. I was like, well, there's already a lot of value in having this home and I need to be able to, to stay here and live and do all the work that I want to do and not worry about if my comrades really can pay or not, or if, you know, and I do a lot of activist work, which there is some side of financial, you know, I, I have to do work. And, um, so I started renting my room and that kind of in a way sustained in my practice and this is my studio. This is where I created a lot of my work. Even before pandemia, COVID, I was already kind of in isolation because I do everything from home. My life is really interconnected. That's why when I, when I think of economy of living, I'm thinking of everything, life, and work, and art, and community, and solidarity. Um, but now it's transforming the space. I've gone through many, many ways of living in regards to how many people, then more people started coming than a lot of when Maria, we got in touch with Juan Maria, then I start, stopped really hosting tourists in a way, which was a, a strategy of, of economy because that is kind of the, the person that comes with disposable income that I can insert here in more money, right? I would bring them to the shows of my friends. I would tell them about things that my you know, partners, I will also include all the members of my community to get supported here, being that they become somebody that's gonna drive you to the airport. And that way you can make, you know, before Uber and Airbnb, I was already thinking of my community as, as a way of sharing wealth. Um, so then now during the pandemic, it's another kind of like impact to the home. There was three people living. It was myself, Patti Cruz and Cristobal Guerra. And there are all visual artists too, and they're queer. And also queerness is a big part of, of what we have here. It's, it's not only, it's a culture of living. It's, we're queer in many ways. We're trying to radicalize how we share home, right? From many ways, but we share a lot of our creative process here. We can share a lot of our life and abilities. And because of that experience of living together, we realized that I didn't want to do it by myself and I do want a bigger home. So we combine forces and now we're working on La Futura Rosario, which is like the future Rosario, which we hope to be a more, much bigger space. Um, and we're thinking, considering doing a, a co-op, um, Cooperativa de Vivienda, which I just found out doing research that 92 was the last time there was a Cooperativa de Vivienda in Puerto Rico, right? That, that, could, that could go through all the process of being. So I feel that's like a beautiful challenge. It's like, why is it that? the way we need to live in a way because of, of all these things that we're talking about, the crisis. Um, so now we're trying to develop this um, project as a way of combining and unifying with other members of the community, but thinking about queer creators, understanding also that, this, that sense of home and also having property um, because of the alternative families that we have, right? We have, not all of us can fall in what were traditional ways of maintaining and, and securing a home. So I feel that for me, um, talking about for myself instead of about Patti and Cristobal, but for me, I want to make sure that I can leave a home for somebody else. And that's what for me is moving right now, La Rosario. It's, just, it's not necessarily now for me, it's just to make sure that if you need a home, you're coming and you need work, you need to be, you need to be in peace, you need to love, come and and also, you know, I was just talking to somebody recently. It's like, there's also a motherly side of me now that has kind of shown up. So I'm really a, a caretaker here. So I'm trying to, how do I take care of all these young queers so they can, don't have to, the need to leave the island and keep doing the work they need to do and keep, they have so much to offer and the community needs us. So we all need each other. So it's a, it's a way of us staying here. I think it's, at the essence of that, you know, like Rosario is, as an example that we can stay here and live in abundance and happy and create. And yeah. La, la, la Rosario is a way of making it work. So I was <laughs> thinking, uh, la, la Rosario is a house, it is a, or an apartment, it is a space, it is a community, it is a performance space, it is an idea, it's a cooperative. But you also just told us it is a house. It is the house of Awilda or the house <laughs> of La Performera. Or perhaps it is the house of La Mujer Maravilla. Um, 
so I actually have two questions. The, the first one is, what, what does queerness mean to you when you say that La Rosario or that your own practice is a practice informed by queerness? Yeah, well, for me, queerness is understanding our different ways of being, right? In, in the literal way of being weird, right? I don't think there is a normative way of living for any one of us. And I think when you go through your honesty and you really understand what it is that we all need to, to live, which is very different, right? I wake up at six in the morning and somebody wakes up at 11 and that doesn't mean that they're right or wrong or I'm crazy waking up so early, but how do we find a way of coexisting and living together, understanding the way we are? So for me, queer is really a political act of choosing to live life in another way that it is combined with harmony and love and vulnerability and honesty. Um, and with that, also the, all the, the ways that you want to represent your gender or, or, or how you feel and, and, and honesty with who you are, which I, I understand. And, and you know, La, La Rosario is a little bit of like a hub in the sense of like a safe space, it's a brave space where we can come and be ourselves. Um, we have different ways of thinking of that. And I, yeah, I just think. Yeah, it's like radical love, right, from Tara Brack. It's like radical acceptance. It's a way of queer is an alternative of, of choosing to love who you are and understand all that it is to be who we are without comparing ourselves with what media, mainstream, et cetera, is telling us to be. So I think if, when I think of the queer quotidian way of living, which is what my practice is also inspired of, it's understanding being mindful and how we choose to live life and not that we are just an automatic or robot or trying to move in a certain way, but that we're choosing to, to dance in the middle of the day, because why not? <laughs> That's what we wanted to do. And, yeah, and I don't know if you want me to start answering La, La Mujer Maravilla, Sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll trans. Yeah, because La Mujer Maravilla is this the essence or the quintessential of this economy of living. When I chose to do this project, I wanted to be a mother. Um, and I was a queer performer. I was single. I was living in the United States. Um, I was 33 at the time. And I was like, well, I want to get pregnant, but how am I going to get pregnant? I don't. But then it's like, well, if I'm an artist, and I'm a performer, so I can, I can apply for a grant for this. This could be an art project. So I made it this uh, idea of trying to, to get pregnant as, 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 a, as a creative project to also to get funding because I, I didn't have health insurance. I didn't have uh, a partner. I didn't have that economy, right? That sustainability for family or anything like that. So I was like, well, since the process of even trying to get pregnant is going to be costly, then let's make it an art project. I didn't get the grant. I didn't get to get pregnant. I didn't have children, but I've conceived almost like 15 uh, expressions or explorations of La Mujer Maravilla. And when I did a residency in 2013, where is when the project really transformed into something else, which is a questioning of what it is to be a woman and this expectation of being marvelous or being wonderful. And that also without um, ignoring the fact of Wonder Woman and La Mujer Maravilla is this iconic figure from, you know, from, that we all know now, and, and I grew up with it in the 80s. Um, that for me is, it's a way, and, and I will go back to the Wonder Woman just because that's like something else, but in regards to La Mujer Maravilla, the project and the exploration is really trying to understand the multiple ways that we can use the term woman, understanding the that language as a way that was kind of decided upon as being the English colonizer and the Spanish colonizer. So, and understand that, that being a woman also, there is not one way of doing. So the exploration, I'm really questioning a lot of things in regards to how people consume bodies like mine, how do you think of, of the objectification of women, gender violence, um, maternity too. So a lot of things now are kind of weaving in into the project. Um, from collaborations, from community. But the essence, when I started it, I wanted to make sure that I could do the work because I this is a life project. And uh, that's when I really understood that the essence is the body. So, and I think that's the most marvelous thing. And I believe that I can perform right now if I wanted to, and I think that I need 
something else in order to do what I love to do, which is performance or interrupting the spaces to, to transform it. Mm -hmm. um, and going to the iconic figure, um, she is very emblematic for a lot of young women. And for me, when I was young, right, I wanted to look like Linda Carter. I wanted to have heels like Linda Carter, right? And then when you get older and you understand that I'm a Wonder Woman, right? Like I, this just the way I am is, is fabulous. And I can wear my platform and my heels and if I want to kick, I can kick, but I don't need to compare myself, which is I think how society is always, right? Putting us in a place to compare ourselves to things. So challenging that iconic figure, like I would like to, in my dream sequence of this project, when you Google La Mujer Maravilla, you find other bodies there present. There's no more Linda Carter or Godot or Rick. There's all these marvelous way of women and really challenge the image of what it means to be a woman. And also without forgetting the connection with the US and the American culture that brings us into Puerto Rico and also add us another layer of what it is to become something that we're not, right? We need that in order to be approved with the American flag as part of the the costume of Wonder Woman and what does the American flag means for us as Puerto Rican colonial bodies. So then there's those are the things that I try to deconstruct as a way of challenging it and why not appropriating it because they've already appropriated who I'm supposed to be. So it's kind of like a reverse appropriation in the sense of I'm gonna now do this and I'm gonna make something out of it that is gonna transform our point of view and our relationship to women. So La Mujer Maravilla is about appropriating and transforming Wonder Woman and building on the legacy of Linda Carter, who is actually Latina, but from a colonial, decolonial, pers queer perspective in Puerto Rico under U.S. imperialism. Um, Awilda, uh, you have a project called Hashtag Bailar Todos Los Días, to dance every day. Are you still dancing every day? Yeah, since 2015, I dance every day. <laughs> and you post videos of your dancing every single day? I do. I, it started because Instagram before didn't allow videos to be posted. And around that time, that's when Instagram allowed that. And then so I, it was a challenge, pretty much. It was the 31st of 2000. 14, I told my friends tomorrow I'm going to start dancing every day. And the reason for that is because of my age, I never thought I was going to dance for a company, right? Because there's like an expiration date for dancers sometimes in regards to being getting that company gig to call it something. Um, but somebody asked me that day, so why do you want to be in a company? And I was like, because I want to dance every day. I want to like go and train every day. And, they, and then we had the conversation, but I can dance every day if I want to. So I, it was kind of like an accountability thing of like posting it. And I did it for a year. And then the next year came up the 1st of, of, of um, January 16. And I was like, hmm, should I keep dancing? Okay, so now I, I can't stop. It's actually one of the funnest thing I do is I've been really protective of it in the sense of like, if it has no, it's very autonomous. I chose when I want to dance, where I want to dance. Sometimes I dance with people, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I dance in the public space. Um, other times when I'm not feeling, maybe to jump and run, I, I dance laying on my ground, like on my bed. If I'm sad, I still dance. If I'm happy, I'm still dancing. Um, but it's very, very interesting in regards to what it has done, has done for, for many. Like it's inspired a lot of people to dance now on, on Instagram and now, to, in this time, this new right phenomenon, it's great to see how dance is taking over media <laughs> because we all can dance. We all dancers. We all movers. We all every day we, we choose to move something. Our body, even when we're still, is moving. Our organs are doing things. Our cellular level is doing things. Our blood is flowing. So yeah, it's a testament to that. And I think I'm gonna try to do it until I can. Like physically, maybe, or but even though I, even if I'm laying down, I think I'm gonna just move my fingers and my, <laughs> dancing my with da Oh, well, we can <laughs> dance with so many parts of the body. So it's it's very beautiful because you started as a dancer. You even danced on television as a backup mm -hmm. dancer. You transitioned to become a performance artist. 
that you have never abandoned dance. Dance has always been part of that practice and of what characterizes you in your aesthetic and life project. So to conclude this interview, I want to ask you the, the question that brings all of us together uh, for this series, Performing the Moment, Performing the Movement, sponsored by the Center for World Performance Studies at the University of Michigan. And the question is, you, you've already answered it in many ways, that how is performance being used to respond to the political, social, health, and environmental crisis that we face at this moment? Is there anything that we haven't spoken about in terms of performance and responding to crisis that you would like to point out? Well, I just, again, kind of um, coming from the, the question and dancing into the camera, I feel that that has been quite amazing to see that we can stop performing. As much as they tell us we can go into the theater, we can go into the gallery, we can go, people are rethinking performance, rethinking about life arts and putting in places that are making it much more accessible than before maybe we didn't think about it because we didn't have this health crisis of COVID and virus and infection. So it's like now being outdoors is the safest place, even though I always loved it, but it is the safest place. So now that gives access to, now our audiences are transforming. I'm hoping that this is gonna really transform our audiences and, and who gets to see dance and who doesn't get to see performance. and and that, that's been the first thing that at first I was really kind of in my own practice, really resistant to, to virtual performance, even though I would do it in other ways. Like I did uh, Zoom parties at the beginning that because I'm also, you know, I love it to entertain. There's an aspect of me of being an entertainer. So in a way I was performing for that too, but it was only for this party kind of to entertain and keep people pumped up. And I brought out my props and it became this also because it, it was a place for the liberation. We all need to, to release so much during these moments of crisis. But performances is something that we choose to do for that reason, a lot of us, right? It's because it is the body as the vessel of emotion control and so many things that life art has to exist and, and has to inform. I think we still have a lot of challenges um, in regard to performance as a form of art and as a whole. Um, aspect of our culture and and that we're questioning a lot about now what the institutions can or cannot support and what this does the performance space look like in the future um but then at the same time i feel that performance has been a strategy for survival um because it has been such a such a tough tough situation i don't think there's no way of talking about this as much as we all may have some of us had jobs, some of us lost our jobs, so many, so many things impacted. Some a lot of people lost loved ones. And we all have to perform, we're okay. A lot of I, and I think that, that that is like we are all performers because I could see, like even for myself, that I lost my uncle during the time it wasn't not related to COVID, but because so much is happening and I want to be there for my friends. It's like, well, how do I control this presence that I have? Of, of really just wanting to be angry and sad and find a way that I can transform my instincts and my presence to be support to others. And I think we all in some way or another, we did that being also as professors, right? Like when we are professors, you know, your students are also going through something. And it's like, how do you think of performance that way as a strategy of surviving and being community at that moment? Because I think if we understand it as, as something that we can use as a strategy to keep moving on, I think we do, but we don't, we're not all mindful about it. Sometimes we just turn that performance clip on and then you only get performance from that person, which is not okay. But sometimes we do need to be calm for others. And, and I think that as we think of performance as the transformation of energy of the body, I, I believe it is what made us be able to still be here and have this conversation. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights about performance as a transformation of energy and performance as a strategy of survival. Those are really resonant uh, phrases for this very challenging context that we have been facing for the last mm -hmm. year and that people in Puerto Rico have been facing for at least the last 10 years. So, Awilda, Awilda Rodriguez Lora, 
on behalf of the Center for World Performance Studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I want to thank you so much for being part of performing the movement, performing the moment, this series that tries to engage and identify the extraordinary things that performers and performance is doing at this very hard time. So I am Larry Lafontaine Stokes, and I thank you so much. I look forward to being able to see this recording and to see the other artists. Muchísimas gracias, Wilda. Gracias, Larry. Always so grateful. Muchas gracias y gracias a todos ustedes, Lucía, Michelle. Thank you. De nada. Chao.